so we're into week six. Um, you know, so the, the course is really ramping along, which is, which is uh, just good. Uh, getting close to your bigger assignments of assignment two and assignment uh, three. Um, I have had a few people, I uh, haven't looked at this yet because I haven't actually gone and graded these yet. That's this week's plan, but I have read them all. Um, some sort of future posting going on. So uh, comment four, which um, I won't go and click on it to uh, embarrass whoever it is, but um, I'd rather you didn't sort of post ahead, um, you know, because it's a learning process. I'd really like to see what, how your thoughts develop rather than uh, submit posts for, you know, uh, when they're supposed to be due a little bit later. Anyway, um, so we're looking at learning theories. These are the presentation topics we've got for this week. You can see there's a few people post their links, which is great. So just to remind you that in the module for this week, week six, that there is the peer review feedback form. So I did have a look at what uh, came through last week. There was, a, there was a slight flaw in my logic of my Google form, which you might have noticed. Uh, it was quite hard to filter information by, <laughs> by uh, name. So I have actually changed it for this week and hopefully I'll fix that uh, flaw in my um, form. So basically I just shared on the announcements the general overview because it was pretty hard to drill down uh, and search it would have taken ages to do it because people enter people's names in different formats, etc. cetera. Um, so what I've done this week if you look at the form for this week, I've done it as a drop down, so you can choose, and that will make it easier for searching uh, via that as a field. And then it's a select the topic as well. So um, hopefully, I'll fix my flaw in my logic in the form, which is okay. This is just formative anyway, but uh, it'll be fixed for the assignment too. So just looking at it very briefly, the feedback was mostly really good. I think the only key area that got a little bit lower was in criteria two around the use of multimedia and um, perhaps that was slightly conjectural as to what people thought. So I won't you know, point out individuals, but I mean, overall the, the, uh, the feedback and I thought the quality of the presentations was great. So there you go. You can probably see where your comments uh, lie if you remember where you put yours. Um, but uh, yeah, it was, it was good work. So just a reminder, stick yourself on the map if you haven't yet. Um, post stuff into the Flipboard magazine. If you're having problems with that, see uh, Lyle's series of posts. He's now the Flipboard guru. Um, Get on board with Twitter. So apparently Lyle has signed up for Twitter, but I haven't seen any tweets yet to Lyle. Hopefully those are coming. Um, but there are a little bit more of a community starting to happen on Twitter. This is our uh, Tags Explorer Def Star starting to take shape. Paula is still leading the pack here. And then we have our Mendeley Shared Library. Uh, just encourage you, if you come across some useful resources, literature, to share that in that shared Mendeley library. And uh, if you haven't accepted the invite to the ResearchGate group, um, most people have, but it might be you just don't have a profile yet, or you're using a different email address, then uh, if you are to sign up for ResearchGate, please email me the preferred address. Okay, so there's a variation of tools. So, um, yeah, there's been quite a bit of activity on the blogs, which one would expect seeing as that's the next part of the assessment. Um, so I'm using Feedly here just to give you a quick overview, just to give an idea of the amount of comments and posts that have been going on. Uh, it's just a nice way of seeing, there's actually been quite a lot of activity, so that's, that's great. Hopefully you're finding that useful. And then let's bring us on to the presentations. 
I've got a timer. So there we go. <laughs> I'll, I'll activate the timer and um, we'll, we'll try to keep the first two presentations to time at least. Um, and I'm going to jump out of screen sharing now. That's probably enough of me talking. Now, there was, was there a question? I thought I heard. Yeah, I'm, I'm struggling to find the link again for the form. Sorry. Oh, for the form? Okay. So if you go to module uh, for week six. Oh, thanks, Caitlin. Someone's Should posted on. on the chat. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Thanks. <clears throat> Let me bring up the chat window so I can look. There we go. Great. Use the hive mind. Okay, so our first presentations, my video is frozen again, but it doesn't matter at this point, uh, is over to Sam. I'll make you co-host. Here we go. And Patrick. So over to you, Sam. Oh. Patrick, I'm just sharing my screen. Okay. I'm going to copy and paste the link into the chat for anyone who wants to follow online. Great, that's coming through. Yeah. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Tom, for the introduction. And uh, thank you all for coming and joining us today. Uh, we are going to talk to you about program-based learning. And uh, with this, we will first, uh, uh, Sam, could you please go to the next one for me? I can't control it from my end. Good. So we'll just start with this video demonstrating that even with uh, animals, they, they learn by doing, and that, is the foundation of our presentation, uh, program-based learning. So this is an octopus in, in a, a glass shield and uh, it's trying to find its way out. And it is, an, it is a demonstration of our understanding of uh, program-based learning. If you don't do it, you will never get to solve your problems or you can never get to address the issues that you face. So a sealed, uh, Octopus is trying to find its way out. So we just run for a few seconds and we'll move on with the presentation. Great. Sam, are you there, please? Thank you. Good. So just with uh, the octopus trying to find its way out and of course successfully did that, uh, so are uh, with human beings. We start as an uh, infant trying to learn how to walk through to solving rubrics. So life in itself is based on our problem-based learning. But uh, this understanding, we are going to explore that in details in terms of how it emerged and how it has influenced our teaching over, over the years. So when we talk about the uh, concept or the idea of uh, program-based learning, it was first introduced in the field of uh, medical science by, um, by Barrows and Tambo in 1980s. We were able to manage to get uh, Barrows' uh, photo, but we couldn't find that of Tambo. So uh, they adopted this approach as a tailor-made uh, approach for uh, teaching medicine, and it provided advantages for, both for uh, knowledge acquisition and also development of essential skills for uh, health workers. So why should we be concerned about problem-based learning? Traditionally, understanding of uh, learning has been uh, being taught in class or uh, student or learners learn, uh, receiving instructions from uh, uh, they are lecturers or educators, they memorize it, and at the end of the day, in terms of, uh, they give an account of it in the form of an examination. 
So during exam time, they reproduce what they've learned and they, they go away. But with the problem-based learning, it rather assigns problems or issues to individuals or to learners. And through that, the learners themselves identify uh, ways that they need to know in order to address the problem that they've identified. And of course, this is done under the guidance of the educator or the tutor. So through that, they learn and apply, apply what they, they, they identify, the problem they identify uh, in terms of uh, providing solution to it. So instead of being given uh, information, then memorizing and reproducing, in this case, in the problem-based learning, they rather assign them with a problem, a real life issue that they can really relate to, then they identify ways of knowing in terms of ways of addressing that problem, then they provide solution that will, at, at the end of the day, will lead to the problem resolution. So, uh, Louis, so uh, the problem-based learning framework that we have here focuses on four key areas. We, it is non-linear, non-linear because our students or learners, they work in from multiple directions and explore diverse avenues, including ideas and theories. And they are not just, they don't just receive information and reproduce it at the end of the day. And because uh, they deal with real life issues in the form of identification of a problem or an issue, it becomes authentic because they can relate to it. Then they can also personalize it because uh, the learning process moved from, moves from uh, the, the educator or the lecturer to the students so they can personalize it and connect with other groups of people or other individuals who are working on the same issue. Then it provides a guide and scaffold in the sense, in the sense that it steers learners, learners in the right direction using prompting questions and providing the needed resources they are able to uh, position themselves to address uh, critical urban issues. Good. So traditionally, we look at our, our learning process, starting with uh, remembering through to creating ideas. But with a problem-based learning, it assumes that all these uh, levels or themes can be learned uh, simultaneously, depending on the urban issue that will be introduced. So instead of following a linear approach, it rather looks at, looks at learning from a multi-dimensional or multi-perspective. So that is the difference between the uh, problem-based learning and that traditional way of learning that uh, we previously are uh, used to. Can go to the next, please. So the question is, why then do we have to use problem-based learning in our teaching or learning? Uh, one, problem-based learning is important because it focuses on student. It is a student-driven approach to learning. It and it it also uh, prevents students from relying on what. They will, they, will, they will reproduce at the end of the semester or at the end of their studies in terms of writing exams, but rather provide them with knowledge and skills that they can apply going forward, even after their studies. So problem-based uh, problem learning often uh, deals with open-ended problems. So in my department, for instance, uh, problems are we deal with urban issues, so students are allowed to pick any urban issue from traffic congestion to housing, and uh, they deal with it. They go and collect data on it and come and present it in class. So this is an open-ended question type of uh, presentation, and that they draw from different breadth of experiences to address the urban issue that they've identified. Uh, so it moves from people to creating. So uh, it is not just about replicating, as I, as I said earlier, it is not about replicating, but it is more about uh, providing uh, people with the ability to create the skills to, to solve uh, problems that confront our, our world today. So at this point, I will, I will call Sam to just conclude as uh, we have two minutes remaining. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I will um, move, move a bit quickly because uh, some of these we've already touched on. So basically, we've said that traditional teaching is exam focused. We teach in a lecture or in a tutorial. We give the students ways to reach that uh, the answer that we want from them. They learn how to reach that answer and then they try and reproduce that answer in the exam. But with a problem based learning, it is very much student focused. It challenges the student mindset from going, what will be on the exam? 
It removes all of that fear and anxiety of failing and helps them just focus on their learning outcomes um, purely from being able to solve that problem. So we start with defining a problem. They have to assess the problem, understand it, identify what's, uh, what's lacking in their knowledge, and then work out how they're going to gain that knowledge in order to solve the uh, problem. Um, as we talked about earlier, the framework does provide um, needs, uh, needs for us to provide the students with a genuine real world problem. The student also has a responsibility in that they have to take ownership of the task. The teacher or the lecturer is in this case acting more as a facilitator who has authentic knowledge and experience and can share that authentic knowledge and experience with the students. And to provide, um, the teacher also has to provide the opportunity for self-reflection on those learning activities um, and the process of that learning as well. So the students realize what they're learning as they go and also recognize what they're not, um, what they're missing as well. So I thought we'd do a small case study uh, of a program called the Biodesign Innovation Program that runs here in the um, University of Melbourne. It's a collaboration between the School of Business and the Department of Biomedical Engineering. It's based on the Stanford model of the Biodesign Program, uh, where what we do is we follow um, a process where we go every problem, you start with identifying the problem, then you go around to inventing um, the solution to that problem, but it's an iterative process. While you're inventing, you have to go back to the identification, work through what's uh, missing, and then come back to inventing, making sure that the solution that you come up with meets the need. And finally, you go on to implementing, and by the time you get to implementing, uh, you want to be able to say what I've created actually solves the problem and has a business avenue as well. Um, with this program, what we do is we send our students out into the real world. We send them to hospitals and we say, go and look for pain points that, um, that the doctors or surgeons are facing. Identify the problem yourself. Come back and we'll discuss what the problem is and then we'll move to finding a solution. So they spend the whole year starting from identifying the problem through to coming up with the solution. And in the last three years or four years of running this program, uh, we now have three startup companies that are highly successful. They're moving on through the clinical trial process now to be able to take their, um, take their devices to um, commercialization. So they're doing really well. Uh, it kind of shows the, um, the benefit of problem-based learning. Um, some limitations, some of the biggest limitations is really teacher focus. It is hard for lecturers to create enough genuine tasks. It's actually hard to provide experience in going to the hospital for every student. It's really difficult to organize these things. It's hard for us to assess the students um, based on what they've learned, particularly when they learn in a group, you don't know who's learned how much. Um, so differentiating that becomes really hard. And the burden of marking almost appears a lot greater than marking an exam because of the detail that you have to go into to understand uh, the diversity of fields. For example, in the biodesign program, every project is different. And because every project is different, you don't know um, all of the details of every single project and you have to actually learn those details before you can mark them adequately. So it is actually quite a difficult uh, process to mark. But as I said, most of the limitations are teacher focus, not student focus. So that's um, so basically we are we'd say the program problem based learning is a good way to consider, uh, particularly where we have um, we can pose questions to the students where they have to go and seek uh, the answers out um, in project type subjects. This would be a great way of moving forward as well but also in most of our subjects, we might be able to apply this. So with that, we'll conclude. And um, if you want, want to look at some of the references, you can have a look online on that link as well. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Sam and, and Patrick. Um, we'll have to forego questions at this point because Helen uh, has a meeting to go to as well. So we we'll have to get Helen and Daniel to um, move on with the presentation, but perhaps we'll 
post uh, feel free to post questions um to the discussion forums um and uh we'll, we'll probably talk about the presentations a little bit later in the, the uh, zoom meeting so thank you that was that was awesome over to helen and daniel i'll start okay. my timer again can you uh, give me privileges to oh here there yeah i just here, i just did yeah all right thomas can i ask as well we're going to be all doing right. um breakout group activity just for two minutes would you be able to at the right time put us into breakout groups of pairs just two people uh let me see if i if i give you full rights you should be able to do that as well okay while we we figure that out uh, let me start in you know honoring the time um so i just made thank you everyone foremost. okay And I don't know how to, okay. All right. So um, we're going to talk about the flipped classroom. And this is, you know, Helen Stitt and myself, Daniel Capuro. So um, first, uh, a definition. And I like this idea that um, the flipped classroom is not, a, you know, a philosophy or, a, or a, it's a teaching strategy where, uh, so you can use it implement many different methods using this teaching strategy uh, where the traditional teaching happens outside of the classroom. In a bit of history, in the 1990s, there were some reports from higher education uh, inverting the classroom. And that means providing this, you know, traditional teaching outside of the, of the classroom and then uh, focusing the actual face-to-face -face time on more relevant work um, and that's uh, reflected in a, in a relevant paper by Lage in, in, in the year 2000, inverting the, the classroom. Um, and, and, and a bit of fun history when, when this started to you know, really, really take off was after uh, this uh, report in 2009, where two sc high school teachers wanted to find ways to reteach lessons for students that were absent. So they decided to record some videos. Um, and this is where uh, of course, the internet was, you know, fully picking up uh, web 2.0, where you can start generating your own, own context. So the, the combination of the need uh, before and now the tools uh, were the were the perfect mix. And these are the two high school teachers, Jonathan Bergman and Aaron Sams. Uh, they were teaching chemistry in, in Colorado. And there's a, a nice paper where they report and the, the tools available at that time, which um, look nothing like the tools that we have available, you know, 12 years later. So what got flipped? Uh, standard content uh, was deli uh, deliver activities like lectures and interactive sessions were delivered online and access before class. And in-person sessions were uh, focused on uh, complex ideas, working through problems, etc. And um, again, as an educational strategy, a variety of methods can be used to deliver information and design of learning activities. So you can mix up with all these different uh, uh, learning theories uh, and, 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 and educational strategies. So the basic idea is that these, the scarce resource, which is people's time, and I added this physical presence now, which is uh, scarce now, uh, would be devoted to working on aspects where human interaction is the best tool. And going back to the, the Bloom's uh, taxonomy, um, again, at the top of the pyramid, we have the most complex learning, uh, learning processes. And those are, folk, are uh, worked up on class and uh, more uh, you know, basic fundamental are left for out of class, remembering, understanding. So the, the baseline context is provided out of class and the in class is, work, is devoted to work on the more complex ones. Different theories behind this strategy. Um, one is, uh, you know, understanding that lectures, paper, uh, books are not knowledge but information, and knowledge needs to be built or rebuilt by the learning a learner or by communities of learners. Um, with videos, students have control and flexibility to access these contexts whenever they want at their own pace and reducing cognitive load. And students' motivations play a significant role in their learning. 
then I'm, I'm obsessed about evidence supporting whether things work or not. So I, I ran a search in this database. It's focused on healthcare, um, but it's a database of systematic reviews and there's at least 17 system systematic reviews and two broad synthesis of flipping the classroom in healthcare. Um, and I did a quick scan of this literature. There's a reasonable body of evidence, as I mentioned, uh, several randomized controlled trials. I would say that results are still heterogeneous. You know, there are different methods, different methods of assessing the, the effectiveness and so on. Most of the studies uh, measure effectiveness in terms of uh, scores at the end of the, uh, the course. So the quick sh uh, scope shows slight improvement in test scores. Uh, students tend to like it uh, more than traditional teaching methods, but few studies report on long-term outcomes or more complex, complex outcomes. One of the last randomized trials I found was uh, from November last year, and they reported on results four months after, after the actual course ended, and they, they still showed some favorable results. Um, and so now I leave, uh, leave, I'll leave Ellen with you, um, to run the, the, you know, the in-class exercise. And I need to figure out, oh, breakout rooms. Um, so before we go into right. the breakout room, oh. I think it would be good to be able to just summarize perhaps some of the pros and cons of this approach. Um, so in terms of the students, as Daniel's mentioned, um, pros include increasing the opportunity for active learning uh, in the classroom, um, which brings a lot of benefits, uh, increasing the opportunity for peer engagement, and also the ability to get immediate feedback on questions, um, which is very important. So there's much greater emphasis on developing skills in the classroom, in the flipped classroom model, and less on passively absorbing transmitted information. We know how important it is for students to work in groups, um, and to engage in creative problem solving, as we've just heard. Um, so in terms of um, social constructivism, um, this is a really important benefit. Um, the benefits are, are more clear, I guess, than the cons. Um, but in my research, I did find some discussions which were quite interesting in terms of the ways in which um, the flipped classroom might present difficulties. Um, so one of the interesting articles um, we looked at was the Spencer Bagley article in the references, which talks about the danger of breaking the didactical contract. Um, so perhaps where students feel like they're not getting enough face-to-face -face contact with the professor uh, and the actual classroom activity is being facilitated by lower level academics like tutors. Um, so that might give rise to learner dissatisfaction. Obviously, it depends on how you prepare and deliver your online videos, whether that's the case or not. Um, there is a bit of a sentiment that perhaps by totally adopting the flipped classroom model, we're, we're throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Um, so Agnes Bosenkett from Macquarie University is quite a vocal spokesperson on this, um, talking about the dangers of letting lectures go entirely. Um, and depriving students of the opportunity to learn to deeply listen um, to someone who's passionate, passionate and knowledgeable about their subject and who's very inspiring and motivating in terms of their own academic journey. Modelling, if you like, academic discourse. Uh, and finally, as an interesting point, um, the Xu Shen Cheng article talked about, um, by looking at a summary of 100 highly cited flipped learning papers, um, that. A lot of the papers seemed to come from language and scientific courses. Um, there wasn't so much of an emphasis or investigation of how it applies to business, uh, art and design courses, for example. Um, so we might ask ourselves why this is. Uh, is it that uh, the humanities like to model that academic discourse um, more in the form of the traditional lecture? Um, we don't know. Um, and they didn't really uh, put forward a hypothesis for this, uh, but it's interesting, I think, to observe. So it'd be great now just to spend a couple of minutes in pairs to discuss what you think would be the benefit in your class, in your subject, for adopting a flipped classroom model, 
what you think might be a disadvantage or a challenge in adopting it. Uh, and perhaps you're already working to a flipped classroom model, in which case you probably have even better insights. Um, so I don't think I can actually... You can do it. Yeah, no, I know. Do it, Daniel, do it. yeah. So let's just go into groups of two and then think. we'll see if we can share some of our observations when we come back after... Hey, Tom. Hey, how you doing? Good. Um, so I'm just going to get rid of this. So have, have you had an experience with flipped classroom? No, not really. Um, I've, I learned about it um, last year in, as part of the G-Cut. Um, mm -hmm. my, my issue with the flipped classroom, um, interested in your thoughts on this, is that it assumes that the students have actually done the work that yes. they needed to do yeah. to be up to date. Um, so that's always been my hesitation around it, is that if I do a flipped classroom, I, am I then still going to be in a situation where I'm having to teach the content to the students that haven't done the work outside? Yeah, exactly. And uh, then you just end up doing double work. So I think the key really is trying to build that um, and make it really explicit into the culture of the course which yeah. you know takes a bit of time so you probably need yeah. to scaffold it over over a few weeks yeah uh, so you've had a bit more experience with with flipped well i guess i, I wouldn't call it flipped as such mm. um i think the floor of the flipped classroom model is is not rethinking you know assessment processes and the interaction component and all you're doing is changing the time when homework happens to be you know face to face and yeah. the lecture content is just content that you expect people to do basically as homework yeah. so um if that's all you're doing then there's no pedagogical change yes that, i saw that point you put in the chat i thought yeah that's um absolutely right <laughs> yeah so i think the the flip classroom only works as a model when you can actually change uh what you're doing Looks like we have to return already. I want us to go back. Is it? Uh, 53 seconds, is it? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so um, I, I, do, I do know people who have done the flipped classroom model. Um, I'll post a link in the chat uh, from Paramedic Electro I've worked with. But he has found by doing it, it has given a lot of free time. So, okay. you know, it was a lot of upfront work. Yeah, to get it established. Yep. Yep, but yeah. then um, once he's done that, he's found he has a whole lot more freedom time as a lecturer and a lot more time to engage with students in some discussion. Mm, well, that's definitely a pro. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A huge pro. So I'll, I'll find that link in. in yeah, cool, that'd be great. Uh... Okay. Bye. <laughs> We're back. Hello. Is everyone back? <laughs> that's, always, that's always the thing with breakouts, not not just the, the virtual ones, is getting people back. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and do they come back or do they just, you know, turn the video off and, and go and make a coffee? Leave. <laughs> so may I invite people to share their observations, perhaps first on the pros, what do you think would benefit your subject by adopting this learning approach? I've used it before where I'm trying to teach students like how to design experiments. And so I, you can, the theory is done out of classroom and then within classroom, it's all about designing your own experiments. And that's why it's really well, because it means that they're applying their knowledge. Um, so I, yeah, I feel like that way to use it is really helpful helps the students kind of be able to apply the theory to real world problems. But you wouldn't apply that sort of teaching and learning <coughs> the whole course, Rebecca? I haven't done it for a whole course, no. You to Just teaching? certain lectures. Yeah. yeah. Um, what, is, what are some of the other pros that people might envisage? I've just posted into the chat there um, a link to a YouTube video, which is a reflection from a paramedic lecturer. And uh, Stephen, I've worked with Stephen quite a bit, but he basically 
flipped his classroom for this first semester of, of this year. And he just kind of reflects on the impact of that. There's a lot of upfront uh, work for him, um, but he's found once he's, he, once he's done that, it's given a lot more flexibility for him, for his time, yeah. and a lot more time for him to engage with discussion with his students. So an interesting little video. It's only about eight minutes long if you want to have a look. It fits in really well to the design for learning kind of strategy, doesn't it, in terms of, um, you know, having that well-crafted, um, pre-prepared content that enables you to be um, more directed on, you know, student involvement and active learning during the semester. Um, Paul and I were discussing the fact that it can actually help um, students who are perhaps less self-directed in their learning um, by working in sort of problem-solving groups. They can have a model of academic behaviour um, and a model of investigation from other students that can be really helpful. Um, so these are perhaps some advantages. Did anyone discuss any cons? Yeah, Tom and I were talking about some of the cons um, and my pers I haven't really tried it and my hesitation has been around the assumption that the students are actually going to do the work yeah. outside of the class so that they've got that base level of knowledge that you need them to have to then do the applied work. Um, so that other, because if they don't, then you end up doubling, doubling up and having to do both of that. But as you know, Tom was saying, it's more about gradually introducing that culture shift to your teaching. Mm. Yeah, and that was something that Paula and I discussed mm -hmm. as well. How do you motivate students? Um, in my teaching observation last semester, I saw that problem in a medical class, large medical class, that half the students were prepared and half hadn't, so they had trouble investigating the prax. Um, okay, so with time in mind, perhaps we'll wrap up there, but I'm sure there'll be further discussion later because some of these topics do overlap quite considerably uh, in terms of um, the different themes that they encompass. So. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Helen. Stop and, sharing. Um, <clears throat> Helen and Daniel. And now, I know that uh, Helen said that she had to race off. Um, uh, are you, do you have any time that you could answer any questions at this point, Helen, or would you rather? Yeah, of course, yeah. I've got an examiner's meeting coming up, but I can hang around for a while. It's fine. OK, so let's throw it open to a few questions. You won't got burning questions, although I suppose we kind of discussed a few already. But... Well, one, one, am I muted? No. One thing that occurs to me is that the, the students in the lecture theatre used to get exposure even if they just sat there and carved their name into the desk or something like that. Whereas now we can't even uh, be assured of that. So this comes back to the idea, will the students do it? Um, that they, they, they had minimal involvement coming to a lecture theatre, but it's more than nothing. Whereas now, if they don't watch the video or read the stuff, they really do have nothing. And so uh, it's been a struggle for, um, for, for me. Um, I was uh, saying to, to Chris that uh, perhaps it provides an opportunity for a bit of social constructivism where the students who have read it have got to teach the students who haven't, but yeah, then they, they get upset. Chris was saying that uh, students felt a bit ripped off, you know, that there's one less sort of contact with the, yeah. um, with the, their peers and their teachers and so on. Um, yeah, I, I think that probably comes back to just that being explicit about what you're trying to achieve and do with, with your design of, of the learning activities, etc. cetera. Um, and once again, you know, students aren't the experts in teaching and learning. And so, they will fall back on this is how we've always done it and this is how I've ah. you know, learned and how come we're doing it differently. And <laughs> um, so, you know, just being having that discussion with them really up front and saying, okay, yeah. we, we're going to engage with the flipped classroom model with this class from now on and here are the reasons why. Mm. And here are examples of graduate outcomes that this maps to. You know, making, making all those links explicit yeah. and sort of also making the explicit link to employability. Um, mm -hmm. This is how we can create those sorts of capabilities that, that employers want, creativity, you know, collaboration, communication, etc. which perhaps you, you can't do it in a lecture theatre uh, or, or, or more difficult. So I'm, I'm not, not necessarily you know, saying the flipped classroom is the way to go, but any, any time that you change the learning environment, you've got to make the, the explicit reasons for that 
and the mapping to the graduate outcome is really explicit for students because they're not the experts in teaching and learning. Uh, and, and so the, the default you know, position will be why? Why is it now more harder work for me? Um, I don't know how to do this. I know how to write the exam and, and uh, yeah. you know, uh, um, write the essay, but now you're wanting me to do something I've never done before and I don't know how to do that. I think I'd say that perhaps there's more onus on the student to do the preparatory work when they know that it, there's going to be active learning and group work and problem solving in the class that they have to participate in because um, you know, there's, an, there's the onus there that what will they do for that one or two hours if they you know don't have the skills. Um, yeah. I, I do tend to find that perhaps the flip classroom is, is slightly light on links to uh, to learning theory com compared to some of the other frameworks. Uh, it does seem to be more of a pragmatic type of approach, but uh, I, I think you can certainly make the case and link it more explicitly to uh, certain learning theories. It's just perhaps a lot of people haven't thought that deeply when they go into flip mode. Yeah. And there is a huge, I know in my faculty is a huge pre, uh, pressure to adopt it just to release lecture space. <laughs> yeah, without necessarily oh, thinking, think what are you actually doing and what's the point? Yeah. 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 yeah, it's just, it's the latest cool thing to do and let's do it. And But why and are you actually doing anything differently in the default position would no, you're not. You're actually just changing the time when stuff happens. I think with architectural history, like a humanity subject, it actually does work really, really well. Um, but yeah, um, it does depend on the quality of the preparatory material as well. Um, so you don't want that just to be, you know, a recording, a video recording of what the lecture would have been. Uh, it needs to be, um, you know, yeah, yeah. restructured. Yeah, you've got to think beyond just lecture capture for the flip classroom to work. Yeah. Mm. Hey, well, we better move on to our next presentation. Thank you. You've got a bit of discussion going there, which is great. Um, and we won't be offended if you have to head off. Um, Thank you. So I think next on our list, we, I think it was Leah. Are you okay, Leah, to, to yes, go, I'll make um, you co-host? Yeah. Uh, why is that not coming up? Maybe I need to, Daniel, perhaps you need to make me full host again, <laughs> by the looks of it. <laughs> okay, I think I, no, what was it? No. Oh. So you just click the three little dots next to my name and go make host. Okay. Because I seem to have make lost host. control. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there you go. <laughs> I'm now host, excellent, okay. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I thought you could have more than one host, but obviously not. So I'll make you a co-host, Leah. There mm -hmm. we go. Okay. I'll share my screen. Um, you can watch the slides online as well, but you won't need to. So feel free to just stick with my shared screen. Can you see my screen, everybody? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So I'm going to tell you about rhizomatic learning, trying to keep it fairly concise for the next couple of minutes. Um, rhizomatic learning is another learning and teaching framework. And if you're not a bonotonist like me or a biologist, you might think something like rhizo what? as a very first reaction. And um, before diving into the rhizomatic learning itself, uh, let me just tell you where this name comes from, rhizomatic learning. And it is a botanic metaphor where in botany rhizomes are plants that do not spread from a single trunk, like a tree, as you see on the left there, um, but they spread in an interconnected, networky kind of way, not just from the bottom up, but into all directions, new connections can be made, connections can be lost, um, new, new things can spread and so on. Whereas in the tree kind of way, you have the single root from which everything spreads. So the branches up there, if you think about that as the emerging knowledge, it all comes from a single root. And you might already see that this 
uh, there's a link there to traditional curriculum based learning where you have the curriculum, you have the teacher who spreads the knowledge, who basically aims to duplicate the knowledge into all the students in a kind of tree like system. Whereas in rhizomatic learning, that's exactly what we do not want. And what we want instead, I will tell you on the next couple of slides. Um, rhizomatic learning was put forward mainly by Dave Cormier. And he defines this as creating a context, maybe some boundaries within which a conversation can grow. So really just provide a very, um, a very abstract or a very broad scaffolding, but do not guide too much. Learning should not have a clear structure, but also no clear beginning or end. So it's an evolving process. It's not bound to a single class. Um, another metaphor he uses is learning as a map, where you can enter and exit the map at different um, points. You can find new connections, you can traverse the map in different ways, and it all depends very much on you, where you come from, what your interests are, and you find your own way through this learning journey. Um, and kind of preaching his own, uh, practicing his own preaching, um, rhizomatic learning seems to be more of a mindset, a collection of ideas rather than a strict and predefined framework. Uh, and to drill down even a little bit more deeply, we will uh, approach the rhizomatic learning ideas through asking and answering three questions following how Dave Cormier did this himself when he presented his ideas. So the first question to ask ourselves is why do we teach? And in the rhizomatic framework, we do not teach in order to pass on established knowledge. Instead, we teach in order to enable students to grow. And ideally, they would, in the end, outgrow the teacher. So we really want to give them a push and give them a framework. But um, it's up to them to um, leverage these opportunities and to really grow and push the boundaries. And the teacher is the enabler, um, providing a little bit of guidance, but no constraints. Um, and in guiding he or she, the teacher should promote the construction of new rhizomatic connections in all directions. Um, the second question we could ask ourselves is how do we structure successful learning? Um, and the answer of the rhizomatic school is we don't, which shouldn't surprise you by now. So what we want to do is establish a context, but not the content. And again, here's the garden metaphor. We see the syllabus or the cur curriculum as a garden, which we kind of plant and design together with the students as we go along. And one concrete idea, concrete concept that I came across is live slides, which I found slightly alienating, but perhaps worth a try where as a teacher you don't come with a prepared set of slides but you create them as you go along together with your students so perhaps something to think about um, and the final question i want to discuss is what does a successful learner look like um, in the rhizomatic framework and i guess in common sense a successful learner is not a storage facility of established ideas so we do not just want to fill in the knowledge into the students with the aim for them to be able to reproduce the knowledge, but we want them to go beyond that. We want learners to be critical, not to just trod accepted paths, but to think their own thoughts in a critical way. Um, in the rhizomatic framework, learners have to be independent. Since there's only very broad scaffolding, a learner has to have his or her own push. Uh, and drive to explore, to grow and to develop, and he or she is responsible for his or her own progress. Um, and there's another metaphor in the rhizomatic um, paradigm, pretty prevalent, and it's pretty um, extreme language, I find. You will see this in a video in a second as well. So Dave Cormier compares uh, traditional learners or frames traditional learners as soldiers who are being, um, constructed by the traditional educational system, who just pass on knowledge from generation to generation to generation in kind of a mindless way. And he contrasts those with the nomads, um, derived from nomads, N-O-M-A-D-S, who are much more free, much more self-determined, and they kind of wander the landscapes of education 
and uh, much more critical and um, yeah, um, flexible in what they know and can learn and teach. Um, and I will now show you a short video which summarizes all these ideas very nicely and very graphically. So let's have a quick look at that. I can't really hear. Is there audio? Okay, let's leave it at this. Uh, and you probably saw a couple of the concepts I talked about earlier. So there are things growing towards the right-hand side of this picture in a kind of unstructured way. We have the soldiers which are being raised to become workers who comply um, with established knowledge on the left. So this is pretty obviously not what the rhizomatic teacher wants. And uh, on the right, you have the nomads who wander freely, who are also apparently a little bit more technically apt compared to the soldiers, which may or may not be the case, and they definitely seem much happier. So here's the summary of the ideas of rhizomatical learning. And now I want to very quickly talk about two examples of rhizomatic learning. Uh, one where I won't go into any detail is Duolingo, which a lot of you may know. It's an online language learning app where you can learn one of almost a hundred languages, I think. And you're completely free in at which uh, level you want to enter. You can skip classes if you feel um, you're able to do this. You can freely choose the topics you want to, your classes to be on and so on. So it's truly learner driven. There's no strict path or predetermined path you have to take. The second example is a MOOC, a massively open online course, uh, which happened in 2014. It's called Rizo 14 MOOC. Um, and it's been facilitated by Dave Cromier, the inventor of Rizomatic Learning. And his idea was to invite a bunch of people to a conversation about his, Dave Cromier's work, to see if they could help him make his work better. So that was the whole idea. There were about 500 participants and only very rough scaffolding. Um, so every week was kind of centered around a provocative statement and the statement um, was developed ad hoc. So as they went along, an example statement is, is books making us stupid? And then there was a week of pretty unstructured discussions around that. Um, and to conclude this presentation, I just want to give you three quotes from Dave Cromier himself and from one of the Rezo 14 participants, um, and then ask a couple of concluding questions, which we could discuss if there's time and you feel like it, or you could just think about yourself. So um, perhaps as a summarizing quote by Dave Cormier, he says, knowledge can only be negotiated and the contextual collaborative learning experience is a social as well as a personal knowledge creating process. So um, learning in the end is the responsibility of the learner and should be um, adjusted to the learner's ideas and preferences and so on. 
Dave Cormier also suggests that the Rizzo metaphor may be particularly apt as a model for disciplines on the bleeding edge, where the canon is fluid and knowledge is a moving target. So new fields, new ideas, where there's simply not a curriculum we can follow might be a good way to get started with rhizomatic learning. And, and to give you a kind of a different perspective on the whole idea of the rhizome and spreading knowledge, one of the participants said a rhizome seems to be a pernicious, pervasive weed rooted in a lot of dirt and shit. So this might give you an idea that perhaps rhizomatic learning is not for, for everyone and not suitable for every um, learning setup. And so here are my um, thoughts to perhaps start a discussion. What do you think about inclusivity for rhizomatic learning? Do you think it's inclusive for all the students if you just go all the way and um, adopt the rhizomatic framework? What's the role of the teacher? Um, is this a student-centered approach or a teacher-centered approach? If you think back to the motivation of Dave Cormier for his Rizzo 14 MOOC, it seemed to be centered very much around his own interests. So is the main motivation really to push the students or could there be other motivations as well? Um, and then um, Dave Cormier already mentioned that he thinks it's particularly apt for um, bleeding edge subjects. So what about traditional or foundational subjects as probably many of us teach? Um, is there a place for rhizomatic learning? Don't we need to teach how to learn independently, perhaps, before we can dive into rhizomatic learning? So I'd also like to think about where an appropriate place in the curriculum is for this and how broadly it could be adapted in general. And that's it for me. Happy to answer questions or discuss. Thank you, Leah. So let's throw it open to questions. What is the end group that you've mentioned? Tom? Yeah, so uh, that, that was part of, I think, um, Bell's and Meekness' criticism of, or critique of the RISO 14 um, MOOC uh, effectively was that uh, there was a small cluster, a small group of, of uh, core, core members uh, who really got a lot out of it. Um, I can't remember how many. Um, and uh, you know it really worked really well for them and then there was thousands of other people who who basically really didn't feel they got anything out of the MOOC um, so that, that was probably one of those those people who made that last comment from <laughs> Paul that uh, that Leah Paul pointed out uh, so yeah it does it does it's very much dependent on self motivated self-directed learners and, you know, so this, the whole idea is around rhizomatic learning and uh, went along with the development of the concept of MOOCs. This was Dave Cormier and, and George Siemens, who, who both in Canada. And, uh, oh, the other guy, uh, crazy autistic guy uh, from Canada, can't remember his name right now. He looks like, uh, like, a, like the wizard. Um, so you know that 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 sort of group of three got together and really brainstormed this idea and wanted to really rethink higher education and so it was very much their ideas and they basically got a group of people who agreed with them um and you know they loved it they thought it was fantastic but then all the other people who wanted to you know just join on the periphery and learn something didn't so that's the downfall of, of, of MOOCs. But what I do like is that any one of these frameworks, any one of these learning theories, there's some gold nuggets there. And uh, what for me really struck a chord was this concept of triggering events. And uh, I guess that for me made sense. It was our job as a, as a lecturer, as a teacher, as an academic, is to design triggering activities to make people think, to get them into a space of being creative. And I really like that. Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, there's pros and cons around all of these. What do other people think? Lyle must have an opinion. You're muted. Ah, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I do. What, what occurs to me is that when you read university promotional to what the role of the university is to challenge existing ideas and to forge new pathways and to split infinitives to boldly go and all of that sort of thing. But 
a lot of students are just there to learn how to be competent practitioners in, in medicine yep. or statistics or whatever. So there's just two groups and it seemed to me these, those, um, those guys sort of um, a, a bit like a bunch of modern musicians who um, they use this expression called the soundscape or the sound environment or something like that. So they step beyond music and they're just sort of riffing on noise. Seems like these guys, this idea of creating knowledge and and sort of getting groups together to see where the mind could go, it's a great idea. But I'm not sure it scales to Australian higher education. Yeah, it's a bit like jazz music, isn't it? So I'm just yeah. kind of thinking, you know, you have uh, you know incredibly talented people who can, you know, jazz works for them. Um, but then you've got a lot of musicians that actually have to work hard at doing their music, and jazz doesn't work because it's so free form, you know. Yeah, yeah. So it would be tough to rewrite yeah, the music curriculum or a computer science or a mathematics curriculum where you, <laughs> um, yeah. So we sort of need a system of measurement, you know. So let's invent numbers and yeah, we're pretty hard going. Yeah, yeah. Any other thoughts? I look, look like Listen, I, I think that um, also, you know, trying to find you know a match between the teaching methods and the learning uh, styles. This is probably one of many teaching methods or philosophies. And it might, again, I agree that it might work in certain situations and others it might not work. Um, maybe in one course, you know, a semester long course, you have a mixture of things and you have one session that works with this philosophy, especially when you're talking about, you know, what the future might uh, be, yeah. you know, forecasting, which is another interesting ability. Um, and we're, for which there's not much of a you know structure on how to forecast. Um, so I think it's probably one of many ingredients that you can put into your you know recipe. Yeah, yeah I agree. Totally. Um, it's important to take everyone along. I think the inclusivity idea to make sure there is enough scaffolding that everyone can follow, but perhaps give enough freedom as well for those who really want to go above and beyond and shape their own trajectory. So I definitely yeah. think there's room for these ideas. In higher yeah, scaffolding in time and time for reflection. So, you know, building up the learning environment to be safe enough for people to be able to do that sort of thing um, and have the time to be able to do it. Awesome. Hey, um, that was great. So we're moving on to our next presentation, which is Paula. Um, let me make you co-host Paula. Okay, so over to Paula. Let me try the screen share. Can you see it? Yep, authentic learning. Yep. All right. If posted the link on the chat as well. For some reason, I can't see the chat myself. Yeah, it's, it's a preference in Zoom where when you go into screen sharing, it hides all the other windows. You have to untick that box. Okay. Um, it's really I might, I might do that later. That's okay. Yep. All right. Yeah, so by default, uh, when you go into screen sharing, Zoom hides all the other windows. They're all right. Very unhelpful. All right, so today I'm going to be talking about authentic learning. So authentic learning is a student-centered uh, framework that informs the design and implementation of realistic and effective learning environments. And it is based upon um, constructivism theory. So the, uh, the idea of uh, you get to do something and engage uh, in active learning and in combination with situated learning theory. So the doing uh, happens in real life context, uh, relevant ones. So the aim of authentic learning is to make the connection between knowing and, and doing. And traditionally uh, in education, these two occur separately. And the rationale was that students needed to learn the concepts in an abstract way to then be able to uh, engage with any doing. And the problem with this separation is that there was an assumption that the knowledge by itself 
was enough for students to apply it to a situation. Um, but uh, according to the situated learning theory, that is not. And this is because uh, what happens is that uh, when there is this se separation, uh, the knowledge is seen by learners as a product uh, of the learning experience. So that product that gets to an end with the exam, for example, rather than seeing the knowledge as a tool to be applied in future situations. Uh, but when you combine them, uh, the knowing and the doing, that connection is made explicit. And it's actually uh, that connection that drives the learning design. Um, for authentic learning to occur, uh, learners must be engaged in an inventive and realistic task that provides opportunities for complex collaborative activities. And I really like this picture um, of the little boy being a superhero because I believe it encapsulates a term that I encountered when learning about authentic environments, which is cognitive fidelity. So cognitive fidelity means that um, the learning environment should faithfully represent the mental demands that happen in the real world. So it's about the thought processes, uh, the problem solving and the decision making skills required. Uh, so here, uh, the child is the superhero. All his emotions and thinking processes are occurring as if he was the superhero. Superhero. So the mask might not be perfect. Um, uh, he might just have the cape and not the full outfit, but that doesn't stop him from being fully immersed in the experience. So how do we go about designing uh, authentic learning environments? Uh, well, there is this framework, uh, fra uh, this um, uh, graphic that um, uh, that ex, uh, represents the elements of uh, an authentic learning environment. And they can guide us on how to put together an authentic learning environment. So I'll go through them. Uh, the first one is the authentic context. So the idea is that the context imitates the complexity of real life settings. One thing that uh, they say about is to have all the resources available. So to be more a chaotic, kind of environment for the student rather than to be really well defined. Uh, so another example would be having all the resources available rather than release them uh, weekly. The authentic, authentic tasks uh, is the most important aspect of uh, the uh, creating an authentic learning experience and these are ill-defined relevant complex tasks that extend for longer periods and uh, I read in one of the uh, references that the activity can be the course and I found that really uh, inspiring especially when we get to the final one which is the authentic assessment so this can actually drive the whole uh, implementation of authentic learning. Uh, access to experts, and here uh, it's about uh, what I was talking to Helen before, is to uh, students having uh, access to exper experts' way of thinking and being to model their own. So um, just to see how, how the experts in the field are doing and thinking and making decisions really can shape their own uh, thinking and being. Uh, one, one example here would be exemplars of uh, reports and things like that, that, that that could help them along. Multiple perspectives. So this is, uh, they, they examine problems from different points of view and take the role of different shareholders. Collaboration. Here, uh, it's key that they actually solve a problem together and not simply work together. I really like that um, description that, uh, that they made here, the, talking about the problem. And also again, uh, reflection is part of the task. And uh, in this uh, framework, they, they, they say about reflection being a social process. So instead of being someone just thinking by themselves, they, they do talk to others about their own reflective um, process.
which again was uh, something new for me. Uh, the other element was articulation, which is a public presentation of an argument to enable defense of the position. And this enables uh, formation, awareness, development, and refinement of thought. Coaching and scaffolding as the other ones, uh, the teacher is there to provide guidance, but the guidance is on a metacognitive level. So uh, rather than being directive, so you talk to them about what they're thinking, what they're doing, rather than telling them what to do next, necessarily. And authentic assessment. So these are seamlessly integrated with the subject and are collaborative. And that's what I uh, mentioned before about uh, the activity can be the cause. And I think that uh, this subject has been uh, a good example for me on that. Uh, is that that as we are going along, you start having ideas about how you would implement things in your own subject. And without really knowing, you're already thinking about the assessment. So now I have, uh, I don't know how we were with time, but uh, this is uh, I forgot an activity. I the clock, so you're fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the easiest one then. Um, so I have here a uh, true or false uh, activity. If you could click on the link, um, I'm gonna pose, uh, I was going to paste it into the chat, but my, my chat is gone. Can someone paste it into the chat for, that's okay. And the idea here is uh, we have five statements about uh, uh, authentic learning and you upvote for true and downvote for false. Um, so I'll give you a few moments to go through it. All right, it seems like we're going. I'm just interested because uh, this is the first time that I'm seeing this. Can you actually, when you're voting, you can't see how many uh, other people are voting just through my screen, is that right? Yeah, Rebecca's nodding. Yeah, yeah you can. can. Oh, okay. All right, so the first one, students can perform complex and authentic tasks without being taught the sub skills required to complete it. I put that one there because according to authentic uh, learning, uh, authentic learning authors, that is true. Uh, I do not agree with it. Uh, I think that as we were talking about problem based learning, uh, you do need some foundational uh, uh, concepts that uh, to, to actually engage in problem-based learning. But according to authentic learning uh, theorists, uh, you don't. You can actually learn on the go. Um, real world activities are not necessarily authentic. So this is true. So um, a good example here is that 
you can create real world situations that aren't actually relevant to students. So uh, one example that I saw is you can create a, a maths problem. Uh, like um, that there are 25 people in the room, uh, everyone shakes um, everyone, everyone's hands once, how many handshakes would have happened? So this is a real world, but it, it's not really relevant uh, to, to many situations. So the important thing about the authentic learning is that it needs to be relevant to students. The third one, um, Authentic e-learning environments are expensive and time consuming to develop because they require realistic simulations with multiple possible outcomes. And this is false. I think we can, um, uh, I think most of the examples I've seen and I've encountered when thinking about authentic learning and before going into this uh, uh, presentation and getting prepared for this, it's was the first thing that pops into my mind. It's um, uh, virtual simulations or field trips or medical uh, learning. But uh, as we're seeing in the current uh, subject, I think, and uh, there are many other examples once you start digging into this literature that uh, not necessarily, you can have uh, authentic learning environments uh, with not much, um, very inexpensive, uh, tools. As long as you have cognitive fidelity, and I think that was the main thing that I've seen. Uh, students need to complete work for real clients who must be located and contracted every year. Uh, the course runs. Uh, false, I, I think that's pretty clear. And the last one as well, teachers can uh, include didactic um, instructional strategies. So uh, one uh, implementing authentic learning tests does not include um, more traditional approaches as well to combine it. So I really like this because it, it, it's it's flexible. It, it's sort of a combination uh, of both worlds. Uh, so in the presentation, so I've got the references and trying to be time wise, I've included here two additional resources and particularly the, uh, the first one you can find videos uh, about each one of those elements uh, of authentic learning environments and how to implement. I really like uh, uh, some, uh, there is a graph with uh, talking about uh, examples of authentic learning tasks that uh, she posted on her website that it's very useful. And the second one, uh, it's just a bunch of resources and examples of authentic learning tasks. So I found that one also very interesting. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. So we'll try it out with questions. So authentic learning, um, some of the key people in the field are uh, Thomas Reeves uh, and his PhD student, Jan Harrington, that uh, Paula has referenced. Uh, and uh, Tom Reeves is now an emeritus professor, so he's basically retired. He's uh, getting, I think he must be about 80. And Jan has just recently retired in the last year or two. Um, so certainly anything from them is useful stuff to read. All right, we seem to stun people into silence. We have uh, two two more presentations left, so let's keep keep this this rolling. So we've got Jeanette. Um, so let me make uh, Jeanette co-host. But uh, thank you, Paula. No worries. Um... Do I need to stop sharing somewhere? Uh, yeah, there should be a stop sharing red button. Sorry, it's the first time that I'm using this with two screens and everything is scattered around. Yeah, so on there the you sharing go. screen, yeah, there, you found there you it. Go. Great, awesome.
Can you see my screen? Yes, we're all good. Great. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about um, conversational framework and also ABC learning design as they're sort of related to each other. Um, but I'll start with talking about conversational framework first because um, that's what the ABC learning design or curriculum design is based on. And the conversational framework is um, developed by Diana Lorillard. And it's actually sort of um, both a learning theory and also uh, a practical framework that we can use for designing educational environments. So it's based on um, this idea that um, learning is an iterative dialogue between the student and the teacher. And that there are, um, yeah, lots of different aspects of that conversation that we need to take into account when designing um, learning. So it for forces the um, teacher to think about not just what they want to say, what they want to teach, but also about um, particularly about what the student's doing and how they're being active in their learning. So when we think about the student from the student perspective, we don't want them to be just um, listening and, and watching, but we want them to be active in, in thinking and acting. So in order to design learning tasks in that um, way, we need to be thinking about what we want them to do, how we want to get them to understand a particular point or achieve a skill or rehearse a particular way of working. <clears throat> and it's based on a few, um, quite a few different other um, philosophies, I guess, or um, learning theories of instructionism, social learning, um, constructionism, collaborative learning, conversation theory as well. Um, it plays a part in, in the framework. So Diana Lorillard um, proposes that this co conversation about, um, between, about um, teaching and learning is based on four main aspects. The, the teacher's concepts about the subject, the student's initial understanding, then the teacher's constructed environment for learning, so engaging the students in the talk and action, and the students' actions and interactions, so their questions and practice and experimentation and reflection and things like that. Um, and that sort of helps with their uh, demonstrating their learning and understanding. Um, and and Lorillard talks about this two-way dialogue between the student and the teacher at each of these conceptual levels. So you can see in, in this um, diagram, the, the arrows going both ways between each of the boxes, which talks about this um, two-way um, process. And there are four um, learning phases within this framework that Lorillard talks about. The um, discussion or discursive phase where the teacher is presenting a new concept and then the learner and the teacher are interacting in a dialogue and collaborating to understand the concept. Then there's the interactive phase where the teacher formulates tasks incorporating the new concept and the learners can interact with each task and, and, and get continuous feedback on their performance. Then there's an adaptive phase where um, further understanding is gained the learners are putting the concept into practice. They're learning to use what they've learned to adapt their actions. And then there's a reflective phase where they learn, reflect on the above strategies and they adjust the way that they're thinking as a result of their reflection. And Lorillard also provo uh, proposes that there are six main learning types. So the way in which we learn um, is kind of, can be categorized into these six um, different types. And that she says that we need to use a mix of each of these different types of learning. So it's not just that one is better than another, but that we actually need to, to use and draw on all of them to, to make a comprehensive um, and effective teaching strategy. So acquisition is where we're learning um, through just you know listening or getting information from websites or books or watching videos and things like that. So we're taking information in. Discussion is when we're obviously talking and throwing around ideas and challenging and responding to each other's ideas. Practice is, like it says, very practical. They have to um, do something uh, to learn and to get feedback on the task themselves. Production is um, a similar so a way that we often assess. So we, we get them to produce something at the end of their learning so that we can um, see what they've learned. Collaboration is about interacting with others and um, 
taking part in discussions and um, group work and things like that. And investigation is where they're doing experiments and exploring and critiquing texts and things like that. So with, a, with each of these different types of learning, they're, they're learning in a different way and it's building a, a, a more comprehensive um, over, overall um, experience for them. Um, the other part of the learning design is, is thinking about how to use technology. So, um, and it's important to have a framework to do that. So, Laurel um, poses the question, what type of activity is this technology enabling the students to do and tries to link the, the media back to the, to the learning experience, but also um, connect it with the method and the technologies that you're using. So she um, proposes that there are four different media, five different um, forms of media. There's narrative, interactive, communicative, adaptive, and product productive that you can see in this table here. Um, and that there are different types of um, media technologies that you can use to, um, to, to, to do that, use media in that way, and that the different learning experiences that, are, that each of those media forms are good for. Um, so narrative media shows us something to do. It might be a text or an image. And interactive media um, might respond in a limited way to what the, what the learner does. So it could be things like search engines or multiple choice tests or things like that. Um, communicative media facilitates interchanges between people. So it could be as simple as email discussion or a discussion forum, things like that. Um, online conferences as well in, in the table there. Um, adaptive media forms are changed by what the learner does. So it could be simulations or um, virtual worlds or things like that and productive um, media enables the learner to produce something. And in the technology, um, this might be a word processor to produce an essay in the simplest version, but it could be something more complicated like an animation or a model. So the ABC learning design um, is actually uh, a type of curriculum design um, framework that's, that's, sorry, that's built on, built on the conversational framework. And it uses a storyboard approach um, to curriculum design. So this, um, Laurelard, I think, is at UCL in the UK. And I think um, the ABC Learning Design um, creators also are at UCL. And they have like a 90-minute a workshop that you can do. It's very paper-based, but it's um, getting, you can see from the picture there that people are, they use these um, learning cards that they um, have a storyboard approach where they, um, get people to map out the course and then the different learning types and then the different activities that they want people to try within each of those learning tasks, uh, learning types with the cards. So um, just to give you an idea of that, um, I thought we might do a little, another Padlet exercise. I haven't used Padlet before either, so I'm going to give it a go. But um, I've put, made a Padlet with each of the different learning types across the top in a column. And I thought if we can go into there, click on the link that's down here below, you'll see a little example here of a close up of one of these cards. Um, so for the learning type production, there are um, conventional methods and digital technology methods. And I think we can put them both in the Padlet, um, but just to get us thinking about different ways of um, different, yeah, things that we can do within each of these different learning types to facilitate um, learning. And if you click on that Padlet link, I'm hoping that will take you there. And then if you just click on the plus sign, you should be able to type some ideas of different um, learning tasks that you might do within each of these different areas of um, these different learning types. Sorry, uh, Jeanette, can you, can you uh, see uh, again what we're going to type in there because I was trying to connect, you know. Yes, yes, yes. Um, if, if you need to look back on the um, Spark presentation, you, you can sort of see the different six different learning types and what they are. But just thinking of some different ways um, that we could, different um, learning tasks that we could do that which fit within these different learning types, either conventional or digital um, based.
So we're getting a fair few things in some of the columns. Nothing in investigation yet. Anyone got any ideas for? I'm stuck on that. I'm, yeah. I'm just waiting for someone to put something through because I can't really think of one. Hmm. And then I guess we have, yeah, that's good. We've got some great, great things coming in under investigation. Um, so maybe some other ideas for practice, practice, practical sort of um, aspects that you could do in a traditional format or in an online technology enhanced way. Simulation's a good one. Okay, well, I think probably my time's up, but uh, yeah, it's great to start thinking about some actual practical elements. And I guess that's one of the things that I um, drew from looking at the ABC um, curriculum design is that it's very practical. It's meant to be quite quick and um, useful and just sort of thinking about different ways that we can, um, particularly, I guess, the, the idea of the ABC is moving into online formats. So, uh, or blended format. So thinking about ways that we can do things in a traditional way and then ways that we can um, use technology or online um, modalities to to help with our teaching as well. But I think I um, might just open up for questions if there's time, Tom. Yeah, great. Thanks, Jenny. Let's move into questions. So I guess one of the things that I really like about the conversational framework and the ABC sort of implementation of it, they're, they're both very pragmatic. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and I think that's one of the things that Laura Lard, when she first put, put the, the idea of the conversational framework together was that uh, she was quite surprised at how popular it became and <coughs> how, you know, people didn't sort of pick it a bit as far as the learning theory behind it goes, although it's based on a lot of, Know, learning theory. Mm. Um, she's quite surprised that, uh, that that she didn't get a lot of kickback and, and critique on it. And I guess that's because it kind of works, you know, it's, mm. it's very pragmatic. So I was, I was really interested too to see, you know, what the uptake of the ABC sort of workshops uh, and curriculum design process is, is in Australia. Have people heard of this before, the ABC workshops? No. I hadn't, I hadn't heard of it. Film. I've just posted um, in, in the link to another, um, sorry, in the chat, a link to the to a little summary of the ABC, one of their PDFs too, if people wanted to have a look at it um, for some more info. I think you're still sharing your screen, Jeanette. Okay. It's okay. It's just I was looking at myself. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, that's, that's, that's awesome. Thank you, Jeanette, and I enjoyed that. Let's, let's move on to our last presentation from 
Rebecca, because we we <laughs> we'll have a late again, but uh, I think it's it's all very worthwhile. So let me make uh, Rebecca co-host, and we'll hand over to Rebecca. Yeah, I'm not sure if this is allowed, but I kind of made my presentation a bit more, um, I guess, interactive or that people could kind of decide what they wanted to look at. Mm. So I can either just talk through it or um, people can self-direct themselves to what they want to look at. I guess it's a bit more, I've put the, the um, link in the Zoom. And I kind of recorded a couple of videos via YouTube and put them in um, and pointed to information and summarized things. Um, I'm just trying to share my screen. So, share. so let me find my presentation. So I, yeah, I guess I've kind of designed this that it would be a bit more self-directed, um, but I can, I guess I can go through it. Yeah, I think that's part of the key of the continuum is that it, it, it is a scaffolded thing, um, but I'm, I'm happy for whatever. So... Um, In the interest of time, perhaps, you know, maybe just talk us through at this stage, Rebecca. Yeah, I'll talk you through, I guess, a few things. So I don't think we'll get through the whole lot in the six minutes. Um, let's see if we can view this. I guess you'll have to let me know if you can hear this video. No, I think it's an option in your Zoom settings under audio and advanced or something, I think, to use computer audio. Uh, okay, this might be too difficult. Maybe... Uh, video but I can just talk through what I was going to say <laughs> um, so basically I um, in this first video I'm talking through the pedagogy andragogy um, pedagogy continuum and so pedagogy is kind of teacher-led learning um, while the andragogy is self-directed learning and hutagogy is different from both of those in that the learning is self-determined. And so then I found myself going, okay, but what does this actually mean? And so in the pedagogical environments, teachers will determine what students will learn, how they learn it, in what order they learn it, and how the material is presented. And so I guess this is kind of quite similar to how we do lectures, um, students learn what information that you would like them to learn, and you present it in a particular order throughout the semester. Um, so the teachers own the material, uh, they are the creators of the material, and the aim is to provide students with basic skills that will underpin future experiences. In andragogy, um, it becomes a bit more self-directed. So the teachers become a mentor or a guide, and the learners are expected to find their, their own solutions to the task set. Um, so the students are more self-directed, but the, the teacher still sets the task. And so I think, um, well, based on my experiences, it's likely that most higher education teaching actually fits across these first two parts of the continuum. As hutagogy actually allows students to define their own problems and questions to answer. Um, so teachers provide a context to that learning but the learner is allowed to explore the subject in their own way. And so this places the learner at the center of the um, course rather than the teacher or the curriculum. And so in part, this is developed because in the past, teachers were often the primary source of knowledge. However, that's no longer the case. We have access to infinite amounts of information virtually all of the time. And this means that we need to learn how to manage and synthesize that knowledge rather than how do we actually access the knowledge. And so thus, there's been this evolution from students being kind of passive receivers of, to analyzers of that knowledge. And so I guess if you just click through these, it kind of gives an overview of um, what I've just talked about. And so then I looked at a few kind of, um, so I guess in the text that I read, they listed a few key design elements of this, um, Pedagogy kind of approach. And so the first one is 
that there needs to be a learner defined learning contracts. And so the learner um, and the teacher sets up a contract. And actually, there's an example of this um, through the Empire State College in New York. They actually have an, a kind of an example of the contracts that they use online. And in these contracts, the, you talk about what will be learned, how is it going to be learned, what will be assessed, and how will it be assessed. And so these things are agreed on between the student and the teacher. Um, so this means that you need to be able to have a flexible curriculum. Um, so the, in a pedagogical um, environment, students um, design their own curriculum based on what their questions and motivations are. It may be that as the teacher you can set um, kind of predefined learning objectives, but then the students can build their plans based on these objectives and decide what they want to learn. And so it's um, empowering the student. Um, so, as well as having kind of this um, contract at the start with a flexible curriculum, that means there's also an element of the fl flexible and negotiated assessment. And so the learner is actually involved in designing their assessment. Um, it's been said that this creates a less threatening environment for the student because um, normally in regards to assessments, we as teachers have all of the control, we set the assessments, we set how much they're worth, um, and this can be quite stressful for students. Um, however, there does need to be some way that you can actually measure that the learner has achieved their agreed aims. So it does have to be measurable. And something that might be useful is um, having a student tailored rubric. So you have to come up with a rubric, I guess, probably most of us create rubrics, but this can actually be created with the student. Um, and a very key part of um, the uh, hutagogy is not only um, kind of learning about the problem and how you solve whatever problem is presented to the students, but actually learning how you learn. So it's not only what they learn, but also learning how you go about your learning process. Um, and this is what's been known as this double loop learning. Um, and so some of the methods that have been proposed as um, useful for reflection include learning journal, journals where the students can document what their journey's been, they can reflect on discussions and explore new ideas. Um, other um, things that have been proposed has been kind of experimenting with real world scenarios, um, which can prepare students for the profession that, that you're preparing them for, and also um, different forms of, um, I guess, assessment. I had a look, I found this paper that helped me because I work in environmental management, um, and it was about environment, uh, double loop learning in, in in um, adaptive management of environmental resources. Um, so this is something I guess I've included the reference that you can have a look at. If For me, it helps me to understand the concept if I can apply it to something that I know. Um, so if you two work in kind of an environmental space, some might be something useful for you to look at. Um, so what are some of the challenges of this? Uh, so I guess in terms of um, teachers, there's some apprehension about placing full control in students' hands of learning. Um, I guess there's also um, kind of worry about how much organizing or what is the practicality of doing this on a full kind of um, scale across course. There was also worry about the financial and learning pressure on students due to increased techno technological requirements. I mean, even just moving um, in the COVID environment online, we obviously assume that all students have access to laptops and things like that, and that's not necessarily the case. Um, and also there's a lack of student preparedness for self-determined learning. And there was this interesting blog here that I read 
it was about can you actually teach something that you do not know so this might is an interesting blog um, from a teacher who um, was unsure about whether we whether students could be self-determined if they didn't know what they were supposed to be learning um, and so I have a few examples here. This is just how to funny video about how to say it. <laughs> um, this is an approach used in schools. So actually this Montessori approach, um, this is an interesting video about how this has been a um, kind of a self um, directed approach has been used in schools or self determined approach up to around 18 years of age. And this is kind of a worldwide approach um and this was my reflection video that you can also watch from youtube and i guess my reflection was that this approach has um the capacity to increase deep learning and potentially better prepare students for the workforce through enhancing kind of cognitive skills things like innovative innovation creativity um, self-directedness but higher education still seems to be more comfortably sitting in the pedagogy and andragogy approach. And it's quite hard to imagine the practicality of an entire course being self-directed by the student um, and having to develop individual line outcomes with each person. So there are some courses or disciplines that may lend themselves very well to this kind of approach. Um, but I think it's also important to note that this doesn't have to be all or nothing. And I guess that's what we've kind of been commenting on throughout is that we could use a mixture of approaches. And so there have been examples of this blended approach where certain modules or certain assessments within a course may be more self-determined. Um, and it's likely, and these courses move along the continuum based on what's appropriate. Um, it's also likely that children, that teachers will need to build the students confidence in this self-direction over time. And it's recognized that student attitudes are really important and that there's a need to embrace this openness in learning um, that allows the exchange of knowledge with others. And so I think speaking from my own experiences, the sharing of information among students is perhaps something that isn't encouraged enough apparently. Um, so, and then I was interested, um, so this, this here, I can put this in the chat. It was just a poll for us to reflect on um, how, what kind of approach we feel like we use in our teaching. Oh no, I'm trying to find the chat. Okay. What approach we use in our teaching um, where you have used a more self-determined approach, what kind of, um, I guess, what kind of technologies or what approaches have you used and um, what do you think of the challenges for implementing this kind of more self-directed um, way of learning within higher education? So I guess I'll give everyone a couple minutes and we should be able to see the results if I can find my results video. Um, should hopefully show up here. So one, one uh, little tip with poll everywhere is the, uh, the mobile apps are great. So if you've got, you know, the mobile um, poll everywhere player, they're, they're separated in two apps, one for the presenter and one for, for the uh, users. Oh, look, we have responses. But you haven't used this one before because I usually use like survey monkey or something like that. I think if you click on the responses. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me see this very well. Okay, so we have, at the minute we have four responses with most people using pedagogy. And I guess I can, um, if people want to just keep filling this out, I can, um, I'll post the results as well. Yeah, that'd be great. Right. Thanks for that. In the interest of time. Yeah, yeah. So let's, um, if you just go out of screen sharing there, Rebecca, and yeah. we'll right open to questions. I think Paula from, from her blog posts has, has been quite interested in this concept. So uh, Paula might have some questions or, or comments. Yes, I do have a lot of questions, um, especially uh, when thinking about the teacher. So the teacher do take more of a, a support role, but from my knowledge of Montessori, it's sort of like a behind the scenes, a lot of work. So you, you are uh, aware of each student's uh, uh, stages of development. So you know, for example, so there are small classes and you know that a child, for example, is ready to try a, a, a more challenging puzzle while the other one needs extra support. So you're gonna put both puzzles for display and if a puzzle for example is not you is not being used anymore you actually remove that puzzle from display and trying to make a connection to that for uh us in higher education and online learning from my understanding there will be a lot of preparation of the environment that they encounter so for me there is a, a, this tension there but at the same time, the teacher do take a, a, a secondary role and just facilitating, but at the same time, is ready to come up and help them at the same time. So that, that for me, it, it's a bit of a tension on where yeah. do teachers stand? Yeah, so it's certainly not less work. <laughs> Sounds like much more work. Uh, and, but but that's, that's where, you know, choosing a appropriate technology uh, can scaffold that and support that, um, particularly as you, you increase in numbers of students. And, uh, you know, it's, a, it's about designing the learning environment with an appropriate, what I like to call the ecology of resources, so that it maps to it, and allows you to do that. So, yes, yeah, so it requires a lot of thinking, a lot more design. Uh, you can't just roll out your lecture, you know, all your notes. Um, and it's going to be a lot more dynamic because it's going to be much more dependent on your actual learners and every class is going to be different because you've got a different group of learners. So um, for me, it's much more exciting as, as a teacher, uh, you know, much more challenging as, as a teacher. And, uh, but yes, it's certainly not less work. It's, it's probably a fair bit more so what, what um, you know, obviously because I'm, I'm very interested in the concept of hudagogy as well myself and that idea around how do you pronounce it? Well, you know, I, I say hudagogy, but um, Stuart Hayes says hoitagogy, um, who is actually the person who came up with the term. Mm -hmm. And um, I've actually invited them to do a bit of a presentation and, and talk to us in two weeks time. And he's kindly agreed. So I think he's really out there a lot more to with him. Yeah. Uh, and next week, we're going to look at a bit more around immersive reality and uh, show you a couple of simple no, tools that you can use that. for designing simulations. And I'll, I've got a oh, no, he's, who's done some. He's in Apollo Bay. Um, and he's no computer scientist, so uh, he'll be able to show what he's done.
we are pretty much out of time. In fact, we've gone well over time, but I think it was, you know, I enjoyed it and hopefully everyone else did and it's useful stuff. So is there any burning questions or thoughts people want to say before we finish off? Uh, okay. Um, yeah, I, I, my reflection on how is it, her to God G, is um, it's working very anyway, well for I'm one of my PhD students. And, and it's, it's really how I'm ready to get on top of the latest stuff. Um, so I think it would work Thanks. great at the, at the top Enjoy end, the you know, at the RHD, the you know, research students, graduate students. Yeah, it doesn't that. necessarily have to be just the domain of, of post-grad though. You can bring that mm. down, but you've got to really think hard about how you do that. And I guess that, that, that uh, example of Montessori is that you can even achieve, the, achieve this in preschool. But it's that scale. With, yeah, but with very small classes and a, a, a high ratio of uh, student, uh, teachers and teaching assistants. So maybe technology could play a role in, in, in scaffolding that and maybe peer learning. Yeah, so te technology yeah. becomes the uh, uh, part of the teaching assistant uh, ecology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So lots of questions and it'd be great to throw those at Stuart when he comes online in two weeks time. I'm sure he's up to the challenge. So thank you everyone. Okay. Thanks a lot. Um, Thanks. We'll finish off there and we shall catch you next week and looking forward to seeing your discussions on your e-portfolios, your blog posts and comments, etc. over the week. Thank you everyone. Once again. Awesome. Bye. See you everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Great presentation. Thanks.